every organized religion is in exact, very exclusionary and exclusive in exactly the same way, and the optimized individual have the sufficient ability to accurately interpret the doctrine in, in exactly the same way. We don't we, we are happy to reject this kind of simplistic generalization. We believe that in reality there are diverse and multiple organized religious structure, and the individual ability is different according to their literacy and the circumstances in which they encounter religious discourse in the first place. Hence, considering this diversity, we believe still the existence of organization is better to provide meaningful religious experiences for uh, as many believers as possible. I'm going to examine several clash points in this debate, uh, mainly two clash points. One, the issue about exclusivity and diversity, and two, and how we can uh, guarantee the autonomy or agency of believers. Number one, about the exclusivity. They gave uh, like three responses, so we're going to give them five responses back. <laughs> Number one, if you're born in Texas, there's no likelihood that you will encounter countervailing views, right? But if, for you, the religion, the religion is a such important priority in your life, you have an option to move to other areas, the, the, find other institutions, the ideology of which you can subscribe to. But even if the areas are so conservative, and even on the real side of the house, the optimized individual are not able to escape from the prevailing conservative narrative, there's not much like a qualitative distinction. But secondly, they say uh, the organized structure is very coercive, so, so that casual uh, believers are predisposed to believe in what the leader interprets in a hierarchical structure. As the size of the institution gets bigger, the, the number of opposition, opposition of discourse in, inside the religious institution gets also bigger. For example, we need to understand the spectrum of believers even inside the religious institution. There are moderate believers, progressive or liberal believers inside the religious institution, or conservative believers. Even in the most, the biggest uh, religion like uh, uh, Christianity, there are so many spectrums of believers. Hence, once the, the, the size of the institution gets bigger, the number of liberal believers, the number of moderate believers also gets bigger. The important thing is, this kind of uh, activated discussion is not likely to occur on the other side of the house when the friends or colleagues have like but, uh, like, you know, lecturing class. Because the sense of the skepticism against the authority is an important motivation for moderate believer or liberal believer to activate discussion. For example, in the Muslim, uh, the, uh, the Imam or uh, the Muslim scholar present a logical uh, countervailing view against the uh, conservative authority inside of the religious institution. This sense of rebellion, the sense of uh, opposing the establishment, is a great incentive for modern believers to initiate the discourse internally. That's how we have been uh, changing the situation related to contraception, abortion, women's rights, or the you know, women's women's rights and the, uh, the importance of Buka as well as uh, uh, being marriage as well. Hence, uh, that sort of activity discussion is not like to occur when the atomized individual already uh, has their, their own preferences without uh, having chances to encounter countervailing views outside their own uh, myopic world. No, thank you. Number three, about the children's issues, right? The consistency is important, is what they have explained. So when, you know, uh, underage or like uh, teenagers uh, encounter different kinds of interpretation, that double standard will confuse them. That's far more likely to happen on the, their side of the house when every single family or every different individual has different kinds of interpretation, and there are more likelihood that children or teenagers would encounter different kinds of interpretation of doctrine. That's far more inconsistent, and that's far more confusing for children. Uh, number four, religious institutions have incentive to cater to different kinds of demands. Religious institutions understand there are diverse demands in our society based on racial identity, national identity, or social class identity as well. Hence, religious institutions have incentive to differentiate their own institutions from other competing institutions. This is sort of a market competition structure. We don't believe there's one monolithic a denomination is overwhelmingly monopolistic in the society. That's not realistic at all. And moreover, even if we understand the radicality or like exclusivity would happen in, in both paradigms, still organized structure is better because the leader, the priest, or imam, or bishop and pope have an incentive to denounce the use of violence, to denounce the radicality or use of violent actions. They have incentive to maintain the uh, you know uh, uh, the perception or or. Re re reputation of their own institution so that they can expand the membership by avoiding the criticism from the society. 
Hence, uh, the, the, we can trust the ability of the institution to denounce the radicality. But the their side of the house, when the in the atomized individual subjectively or inaccurately interpret the doctrine, the probability of resulting to radical uh, action are far more likely to happen. That's why in the case of the terrorism or use of violence, that happens in a context of very fragmented institution, a disorganized institutions. We believe that's far more dangerous in terms of radicality. Do you have any point of information? Uh, I will take you later if you have one, okay? And another reason is, you know, there, the, the previous speaker explained that the bishop or priests have incentives to get promoted inside the institutions, so they don't really try to change themselves. If they continue to stay conservative, the members will not follow them. Members will, uh, will uh, have a sense of skepticism, or member will uh, question or uh, doubt the ways in which priests interpret the doctrine and the preach. Therefore, uh, even the, the incentive of promotion is not big enough on, in, in the reality. Moving on to the clash points about autonomy and agency. The, the first speaker explained that the individual have the right to you know, interpret the doctrine by their own way, right? That, uh, the presumption is individuals already have strong religious preferences. I don't think that's a reality. Individuals do not have such a fixed and you know, uh, uh, you know, a de decided preferences for religion. In, in many contexts, we don't have many chances to encounter religious discourse in the first place. The way the, the amount of information we have about religion is limited. Within that sort of circumstance, how can you gain autonomy or agency in the first place? Especially, especially for un uneducated people or vulnerable individuals or socially disenfranchised groups. These people have less access to a wide range of discourse. On the their side of the house of organized structure, we can better reach out to a wider range of groups. The priests uh, have incentive to proselytize their religion or preach, uh, preach their religion in many uh, areas as much as possible so that many different classes people are able to access religious discourses. We are more able to guarantee or procure the autonomy agency as opposed to their fragmented world. We are happy to oppose it. Thank you.